This month, we are very happy to introduce Richard Krause from USGS Great Lakes Science Center, the Lake Erie Biological Station. Uh, Richard uh, started his career really on the East Coast. He got his uh, BS in marine biology at the College of Charleston, um, went to uh, Virginia to get his master's uh, at the College of William and Mary, and then moved to University of Maryland, Chesapeake Biological Lab, where he got his PhD in 2003. Um, he did a postdoc at Texas A&M, uh, University of Galveston, and then went back to the East Coast and was assistant professor at George Mason University from 2006 to 2010. And then uh, we were lucky enough to recruit him to the Lake, uh, Lake Erie Biological Station in 2010, where he has been the, the uh, station chief, gosh, 12 years now, Richard. So when you look at Richard's uh, research, I would say a common theme is describing habitat and um, linkages between habitat and fishes. Often the habitat is sort of suboptimal, often related to sort of hypoxia, and that's whether it's his research in Chesapeake Bay, of course now in Lake Erie, and also uh, he has a publication from the Gulf of Mexico. So today he's gonna to be talking to us about habitat and Lake Whitefish and Cisco, using the telemetry as a tool to try to get a sense of how these animals that are not that common in Lake Erie, um, that are of management interest, uh, what kind of habitat they're using. So thanks for agreeing to do this. Uh, Richard said his talk is about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we hopefully we don't run into any technical issues. Um, he has what he described as a bloated battery uh, above him. So he's sort of putting himself in danger to give this talk. We're hoping it remains bloated and doesn't explode. Um, we laugh, but I don't know. Hopefully this will go smoothly. If he goes dark, we'll give him a few minutes to see if he can reconnect from a, a different laptop in the house, but we got this. Thanks, Richard. That's a great introduction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate the, the consideration there. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully while I do this, um, uh, maybe just uh, comment that uh, uh, I have really enjoyed uh, that time that you mentioned since I uh, was able to um, be recruited. I had the uh, uh, benefit of, of doing that um, and working on Lake Erie with this, what I consider <clears throat> some of the most um, uh, uh, amazing uh, colleagues and collaborators that uh, I could imagine. Um, one of the things that I want to announce because it has uh, sort of consumed my life uh, for a major portion of the time in this position is that um, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, we have been co-located as tenants on a NASA facility, a secure NASA facility, test facility in Sandusky, Ohio, since um, sometime in the 80s, long before me. Um, and it's created some logistical difficulties. Um, but one of the things the center uh, decided to do was to uh, pursue uh, a relocation uh, action for us uh, where we could co-locate with our research vessel um, I'm happy to say that that has been successful, um, but one of the things that happened this week is we formally accepted <clears throat> the space, and so the move is on in earnest in order to try to get out of the NASA facility by the end of this month, so a uh, lot of targets on the radar, but uh, stay tuned, um, uh, you know, and I hope that uh, as things clear up, we get to maybe see some of you, uh, anybody coming through town, maybe be able to visit us at our new site in Huron, Huron, Ohio. So um, exciting times. Anyway, without further ado, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the Kriganines in, in Lake Erie, um, uh, thinking about their migration, their habitat use, and, and, uh, and cues to their movements to try to understand a number of different questions. Uh, this takes a lot of uh, collaboration, a lot of uh, partnerships, uh, but I want to mention um, in particular uh, the Lake Erie Committee partners that we have, the fishery management uh, 
uh, jurisdictions on Lake Erie who not only have contributed um, uh, their resources, personnel and vessel time and other resources uh, to the to some of this research, uh, but they have also registered their support through um, letters um, that uh, in favor of uh, proposals uh, to do some of this research. So um, we're extremely grateful for that. And we're grateful for the funding sources, which include the Craig and I uh, steering committee um, process uh, that uh, helps to uh, allocate um, GLRI funds. So this is this is really special <clears throat> for those reasons, as well as um, uh, to see some of these results and their implications for management. Um, and uh, my apologies, if some of you who maybe have attended the GLaDOS workshop this week will find a lot of this familiar. So, uh, but for those of you who didn't, uh, hopefully um, this will be uh, uh, useful to you. Um, so thinking about these Carignines and Lake Erie, I think it's really important to remember how productive these fisheries were at the turn of the last century. Um, Cisco and Lake Whitefish, particularly Cisco, uh, really constituted one of the most productive freshwater fisheries uh, of all time. Um, the, 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 the <clears throat> what was produced was huge. And uh, so what we know now, obviously, is that Cisco are classified as extirpated, although we do occasionally pick up a few stragglers, uh, weird incidental uh, individuals. Um, and Lake Whitefish uh, are present in the lake, but not uh, anywhere near the degree of uh, being able to support the uh, uh, fisheries like they did uh, in this timeline that you see here from this classic paper. So we do need to acknowledge what the current state of fishery management is in Lake Erie as our context. Um, it's mainly focused on the person fisheries, walleye and yellow perch. Um, Cisco are extirpated, so they're not really uh, part of the fishery management in Lake Erie, uh, except uh, in consideration of whether we should rehabilitate Cisco in some way if we can. Uh, and Lake Whitefish, their populations or the fishery is more or less stable, uh, still at a lower level than historically, but there is some interest uh, regarding their bycatch in the walleye fishery because it relates to uh, uh, maintenance of the Marine Stewardship Council certification uh, for the for the fisheries in Lake Erie, <clears throat> which are really important to the managers. We have a uh, context here of environmental issues that we need to remember as well. Um, this is the southern extent of the range of these species. Um, there have been a great number of ecological changes in the lake, um, most notably the invasive species, mussels, smelt, the Trevies, Gobies, lots of others. Uh, we have lots of problems in Lake Erie, some of which are very different from the other lakes in terms of eutrophication. Uh, we also have pollution issues. Uh, harmful algal blooms have expanded the past two decades, hypoxia along with it. Uh, there's increasing interest in uh, the potential impact of microplastics as well as other pollutants. Um, and all of these are occurring on the backdrop of climate change. We have uh, differences now in ice cover and seasonal temperature regimes, as well as the lake level and hydrography um, that uh, have really altered the ecosystem to a large degree. <clears throat> so the questions was, with respect to the Corregonines are, you know, would it be possible uh, to even um, have a chance of restoring these native forage fishes uh, to the productivity levels for the fisheries that they used to, um, that we used to see in Lake Erie? Um, or has this ecosystem been altered so much that these species just can't flourish? So there's a lot of sub questions wrapped up in <clears throat> those key questions in my mind. And I'm gonna look at some of those for the uh, species, but we need to sort of think about uh, the context of the life cycles of these species uh, and where habitat plays a really important and possibly limiting role. I really like this figure from Michigan Sea Grant that depicts a life cycle of Lake Whitefish. Um, it does have some relevance to Cisco as well. Uh, and it, in my mind, depicts what happens mainly in the upper, lake cur upper lakes currently uh, and, the and a projected scenario, which may actually represent Lake Erie right now. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that's a big impact, a big concern are the harmful algal blooms, which may uh, predominantly influence the early life stages, but we don't have a good idea exactly uh, what impact this may be. 
Um, we do know that the adults and juveniles will require some type of refuge in the summertime during stratification uh, where the temperature and the oxygen are suitable in the hypolimnion. Um, but one of the things with climate change is we may actually have a negative impact on populations of lake whitefish and the ability to uh, think about how to rehabilitate Cisco uh, because of increasing temperature. We also have an issue with expanding hypoxia recently in Lake Erie. Um, there's more information available on this due to modeling efforts from NOAA, but uh, this of course also reduces the summer refuge for um, Lake Whitefish and any other corrigonids that might be in the lake. So uh, there is a question there about whether uh, this is going to continue to limit um, uh, any sort of uh, management uh, <laughs> possibilities for these species. So from here on, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, sort of uh, categories of study. We've got a, a lot happening more with Lake Whitefish and Cisco, but with the Cisco one, it's really special um, because we were able to get uh, uh, permission and, and resources through the Kriganine Working Group um, to actually um, tag some of the adult Cisco that were reared at the Tunison Laboratory for Aquatic Sciences for a different purpose, but didn't necessarily make it into some of those studies. Um, we got disease certification for those, funding to purchase tags, and to experimentally release them in the lake in order to address questions about um, uh, would they actually utilize the habitats we predict that they would utilize and um, what sources of mortality and how much mortality would we see from fish that came out of a hatchery and were released into the lake. And this helps uh, the managers think about the, the important questions uh, in terms of restoration. So um, got 100 tags, we released 50 in two different locations, one to the east, one to the west. Um, and this is still ongoing. Um, these tags are interesting. They're temperature transmitting tags. They also are uh, predation tags. So we have uh, some initial information, but we're still collecting uh, information from the network over this summer. So this is very preliminary and I'm just going to share some of this as sort of a progress report with you. The Lake Whitefish work, <clears throat> which I'll show after the Cisco, um, is, uh, has been going on for a number of years, kind of opportunistically tagging this fish. Some directed efforts uh, have popped up depending on resources. Um, and again, I already sort of explained the significance to the fishery management in Lake Erie. But with this part, I'm going to focus on uh, two years where we have a lot of fish detected in the lake and where we had a full um, uh, grid array of receivers deployed. Uh, the configurations have been modified through time, but this seemed like a, a good focal window to sort of try to understand their habitat use, spe specifically during the stratified period uh, when, when they need a refuge and when it may be limiting. So starting with the Cisco, we have this nice little picture of one that was captured from, uh, I think, Niagara Reef out of Lake Erie. And this was a, this was a surprise, but uh, I'm going to use this picture to sort of help you track what, uh, what we're talking about. Um, the initial release locations are shown in the red squares, as you see right here. And I have a little animation that shows kind of a course uh, uh, idea, it gives you a course idea of where these fish moved after they were released, uh, at least in the you know, uh, first part of the data set we're able to retrieve. Uh, so there's, you know, lots of sort of initial movement away from the tagging sites, uh, some use of the central basin, maybe a seasonal progression towards the Ohio and Pennsylvania border. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm also going to dive into a little bit is that um, we have uh, deployed, uh, if I can get to it, there we go. <laughs> uh, some data loggers on the receivers in the central basin. Um, these measure temperature and dissolved oxygen uh, and are located in the hypolimnion, just about a half meter off the bottom. Uh, so we can match these uh, data logger measurements with uh, uh, detections of these fish and say something about the habitat uh, conditions that were present in the hypolimnion when they were detected. Um, so um, again, this is um, uh, doesn't have a complete data set, uh, but what we can see here is that 
Um, if we just look first at the data logger values of dissolved oxygen and temperature, uh, we can kind of look at their uh, concentrations of distributions whenever the fish were detected. And we see sort of two main centers of distribution. Um, nothing terribly surprising. Uh, the temperatures were a little bit warmer when the uh, dissolved oxygen on the bottom was lower. Um, but what is interesting is these tags transmitted temperature values. Um, we don't have the ability to measure dissolved oxygen from the tags where the fish was. Uh, and we don't have with these particular tags, the ability to measure depth, uh, just temperature and a predation signal if the fish happened to be eaten. Uh, but we can take those temperature values from the tag detections and plot them on top of the data logger values and get an idea of uh, what uh, the fish were experiencing, at least in the dimension of temperature, reference to what the dissolved, uh, what, what the data logger uh, found in dissolved oxygen at the time of detection. Uh, and so what you see is it's a little more variable than uh, what's happening uh, near the bottom, and that the temperatures tend to be skewed warmer uh, uh, with the fish tags than what was measured on the bottom. Uh, and this may not be so surprising because um, these fish, when the dissolved oxygen is lower, especially when it's lower, uh, may be suspending above the bottom a little bit higher and experiencing these warmer temperatures. So uh, that's just a teaser. We're looking into that further. Um, one of the things that may help us with that is applying the uh, NOAA hypoxia forecast modeling uh, information, which gives us a 3D view of the water column and a prediction of temperature and dissolved oxygen. So. Uh, we're kind of excited about this, and here's sort of a first look at the data coming in. Um, one of the other things with these tags is the predation signal. Uh, we did uh, record some predation signals, so some predation events here after release. Um, there's a big uh, gap where we have to tend a bunch of receivers around the Pennsylvania Ridge, um, and uh, so we expect that this picture will change a lot, but we can at least initially uh, get an idea that maybe 25% of the Cisco were eaten in the first uh, two months. So um, still have to think about the significance of this once we get more data in and see this take shape and uh, maybe these confidence intervals will narrow a little bit, but um, it's, um, it's giving us uh, some interesting information and I just wanted to uh, throw that up there to let people appreciate that. Um, what you can see is that um, the numbers at risk down here in this table uh, declined fairly rapidly. Um, we, we have more fish out there we think that will pop up on, on receivers that uh, still needed to be tended. They were tended prior to the release of these fish. Uh, and so they're collecting data from uh, you know, big gaps in the array that uh, we need to fill in and that'll happen here in 2022 and uh, in due time. And that's why there are so many of these little crossbars here where we have the sort of last known detection of some of the fish that kind of disappear out of the pool. Uh, so there's fewer at risk uh, as these fish move into areas where we don't yet have uh, detection information for them. So now I'm gonna switch over to uh, Lake Whitefish and talk about some of the results with this. Uh, it's supporting uh, a, the preparation of a couple of manuscripts, but uh, there's, some, there's some interesting information of a different sort here. With the Lake Whitefish, we have um, uh, ID uh, tags uh, with these fish. They don't transmit depth or temperature or predation or anything like that. Uh, but we have a, uh, maybe more data and a more complete data set. Uh, and we're going to focus on just the months of July, August, and September, which is our stratified period primarily in Lake Erie, <clears throat> where we see hypoxia generally in most years. Um, and one of the interesting things first is looking at the geography here of the detections. Uh, you can see that we have kind of two main concentrations in either year, uh, fewer detections in 2017. Um, but uh, along the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, we detected fish very frequently, as well as in New York waters, uh, not so much on the Ontario side, uh, but this area seems to be important for these fish in either year. Uh, and of course, um, we've got a number of individuals detected, as well as a lot of detections on a relatively few receivers. And that's emphasized here. Um, the horizontal axis shows all of the limited set of receivers where we got at least some detections from these fish, 
But again, emphasizing that regardless of the year, there's just a handful of receivers that account for most of the detections of most of the fish. Each of the colors here represents a different individual. Um, so uh, looking at uh, uh, those detections, we can um, say something about the conditions on the bottom from this NOAA uh, forecast model produced by Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. Uh, and there are two interesting things we can do there. We can look at the entire array of receivers and the predictions of the, of the dissolved oxygen and bottom temperature uh, from that model. Uh, and we can plot the distribution of those values and say something about the habitats that were available across the entire lake, at least at the location of those receivers. And that's what you see uh, in the contour lines on this plot. And as you might expect, uh, here in 2017, up in the kind of top right hand corner of the distribution, same with 2018, we have a concentration of habitat that is greater than 20 degrees Celsius and in normoxic conditions. In 2017, we see also a secondary concentration around about 15 degrees Celsius <clears throat> in very low oxygen conditions. Uh, not so much in 2018, but we do see a, a second center of habitat availability that's uh, basically in cool conditions, less than 12 C uh, and normoxic greater than five milligrams per liter. Um, but this is, uh, this is just one part of the story. The other thing that's interesting here is this heat map that you see, which is a distribution of the conditions where uh, lake whitefish were detected. And so you can see it, um, one of our hypotheses obviously was that it would be a subset of available habitats, that they would be cooler conditions. And we do see that, but it's interesting the differences between 2017 and 2018. In 2017, the major concentration of detections was around 15 C, but concentrated at uh, sort of uh, hypoxic and near hypoxic conditions, less than five milligrams per liter. There was a smaller distribution of habitat use uh, in uh, conditions that were normoxic, but somewhere between about, oh, you know, 16 and 20 degrees C. This was different than in, you know, what we saw in 2018, which was a main concentration of habitat use that was basically less than 15 C and in normoxic conditions, especially greater than about seven milligrams per liter. Um, so this is one way to look at uh, these type of data. We still don't know if the fish were in the hypolimnion where these uh, measurements are represented here, um, but we can, we can take this one step further as sort of a proof of concept and uh, think about selectivity uh, in terms of the ratio of habitat use to habitat availability, asking the question, is habitat use disproportionately uh, greater or less than availability? And we can look at this in terms of a ratio on the next slide here with a habitat selectivity index. Um, so this ratio can be centered in scale so that we can distinguish between positive habitat selectivity or, and negative habitat selectivity or avoidance. Um, and it just emphasizes what we saw in the previous slide, which is uh, in 2017, an interesting uh, avoidance of warm temperatures, maybe, um, but certainly a uh, selection of these cool semi-hypoxic habitats. Um, in 2018, uh, really uh, a prominent selection of cool normoxic habitats and a little bit uh, stronger avoidance of temperatures greater than, than 20 C. Um, so not a terrible big surprise there, but um, what's interesting is to uh, take these data and maybe extend them even one step further here, um, because this is a static view of uh, only where things occurred, what conditions were where, uh, when and where uh, these fish occurred when they were detected. Um, so we can think about it a little bit differently in terms of how fish select their habitat is actually a process. Um, they uh, take their cues from their current environment and they decide to move around and maybe uh, go to a different environment if, uh, if it's uh, something that they're trying to avoid or, or something that they're seeking out. And there are all kinds of cues that uh, they may seek out or that they may respond to in the local environment. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the different aspects of this because there uh, is the internal state of the fish as well as the external um, uh, stimuli that, uh, that they're responding to. And uh, that's a very complex thing to think about. But one of the questions we had was whether 
um, the movement of the fish would be correlated with um, the starting uh, uh, value of dissolved oxygen on the bottom. And our idea was that, well, if the starting value was low, we would expect them to move somewhere that resulted in an increase in dissolved oxygen. Uh, and so we modeled uh, the change in dissolved oxygen between pairs of detections uh, using the starting dissolved oxygen as our predictor. Uh, and a covariate on top of this was temperature to see if that modified anything. So we developed these general linear models, <clears throat> separate ones for 2017 and 2018, in order to see if we could um, uh, discern an effect here. Um, so what you see on the horizontal axis is the change in dissolved oxygen, and it could either be positive or negative between a pair of detections. Um, and we treated fish uh, as a random effect in here to account for that variability as well. Um, but one of the things that I want to point out, the sort of primary result here is that when we did have kind of a significant effect, whatever temperature it was, um, you can see as we expected, when dissolved oxygen was low wherever the fish was, um, there was an increase. And th this shows, for example, uh, at this very lowest value um, that the increase obviously would have been uh, equivalent to this distance here, which means the fish would have wound up somewhere around three milligrams per liter on average between uh, subsequent detections. Um, the thing that we didn't expect is that out here where dissolved oxygen was high, um, the, on average, the fish tended to move to another, a subsequent detection where the bottom dissolved oxygen was lower. Uh, and the magnitude of this, uh, certainly by the way this line is uh, uh, modeled here, um, is greater as you head out into uh, higher dissolved oxygen. Same thing's going on in 2018. The effect is a little bit um, more prominent here because we have a greater sample size. Uh, for example, at 10 degrees C, there isn't much of an effect. There's a lot of variability because of the low sample size. But here in 2018, we see a stronger effect. It's modified by temperature, but certainly um, it results in uh, these fish more or less moving to the global average or towards um, you know, five milligrams per liter most of the time, whether they were at a high oxygen level or at a low oxygen level. So this is kind of an interesting result. <clears throat> we're still sort of preparing our interpretation of this, but um, certainly worth sharing at this point. And I think really what I wanna emphasize is the importance of understanding the habitat selection process as opposed to just the associations and static space and time between habitat and fish occurrence. Now, as I've sort of already emphasized, these fish, both the Cisco and the Lake Whitefish, we don't have information about the depth of habitat use. And this is clearly important, especially when there's hypoxia on the bottom. They may be suspending in warmer temperatures and just uh, subsisting there for a short period until they can find suitable hypolimnetic habitats or cooler habitats or a seasonal temperature change that allows them to persist. We see this in other species and other reservoirs where they can, they can do okay and just tolerate the, uh, the poorer conditions. Um, so we're thinking about this and this is looking ahead to some more recent data where we've been able to put out uh, acoustic data storage tags that record temperature and depth. They also transmit temperature and depth uh, and we can get the recorded values back, which are very fine scale, uh, if we get the tag back. And because of the fisheries in Lake Erie and the fishery observing that takes place, we've already received from Lake Whitefish that we tagged in 2020, some of these tags, uh, excuse me, we tagged them in fall of 2019 on the spawning grounds, but we have uh, data here that, uh, that you can see um, from these tags that uh, is giving us fine detail information about depth and temperature. This is, I believe, five individuals uh, sort of averaged uh, with daily averages. And you can see there's a lot of complexity uh, in the correlation between depth and temperature that they occupied. So uh, we're still digging into this and we're hoping to match this up with some of the NOAA uh, forecast modeling data from the hypoxia model. Um, this is going to help us uh, uh, with another effort to ask some different questions, but I wanted to point that out as a teaser. Um, lots of work going on, lots of work to be done yet. Um, but in summary, uh, there are three main kind of takeaway points that, uh, or questions at least, that I want to leave you with. 
Um, the geographical distribution of where we found each of these species uh, tends to show an affinity, um, although we have a stronger uh, conclusion here for Lake Whitefish and Cisco, but a stronger affinity for the southeastern shoreline, and we have lots of hypotheses that we're developing uh, to uh, help uh, understand that. Um, as far as the oxythermal refugia go, there is definitely habitat that these fish can occupy uh, when, when conditions are stressful. Um, but the interesting thing here is their uh, confirmed presence in areas where there's low levels of oxygen on the bottom. So we do need to really nail down this um, question about whether they're suspending in the water column to, to deal with that and why they would still be present in those areas and uh, tolerate maybe slightly warmer conditions. Um, the the, uh, the final interesting thing here is that, um, you know, we met our expectations in terms of directional movements, but the but what I think is interesting is the ability uh, to predict this, uh, you know, with a, uh, an empirical model gives us um, a potential future where we can simulate the movement of maybe virtual fish and run scenarios of uh, climate change in the lake or other impacts to be able to say, uh, more definitively, what uh, would we expect uh, fish to do in response to a particular set of conditions, which I think is kind of exciting. What are the implications for the fisheries? Well, for Cisco, um, we certainly are able to provide some direct insights to questions that were raised in this document here on the right, the impediments to rehabilitation of Cisco in Lake Erie. Um, so that's pretty interesting to define uh, at least some of the sources of mortality, predation specifically, uh, as well as the habitat use during stratification. For Lake Whitefish, um, one of the really important things here is understanding when and where they're vulnerable to fishing uh, and their responses to the oxythermal conditions. Finally, uh, with respect to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, there are new nutrient reduction goals that were established in 2012. Um, if these are successful or if these are unsuccessful, they're going to have an impact on the trophic status of the lake. And what we see here is the potential to link those, uh, that impact on the spatial management of fisheries uh, in Lake Erie. Um, so uh, those are my summary points. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and, and maybe see if anybody has questions that I can address. And I really appreciate um, all 85 uh, people attending this. This is uh, this is really great to uh, to have this um, uh, audience here to share these uh, these results with. I'm I'm just very grateful. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and and maybe uh, turn back over to our moderator, Bo. Uh, is that uh, is that okay, Bo? Yes. Nice job, Richard. Um, really provocative. <clears throat> results there. Yes, you all can give your virtual round of applause as we do in Zoom these days, if you like. Um, and I think typically, you know, we people raise your hand through the participants slide and we can call on you. Ideally, if you feel comfortable, flip on your camera, make it a little bit more personal and ask your question in person. If you don't want to ask it, <clears throat> um, you know, via the chat and Roger Knight is going to kick us off before I, normally I have to ask a question first to get it primed, but Roger's ready to do it. And, and Richard, we had 95, um, I think at one point. So. Yeah. Okay. Nice I job. ran some out. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I'm sure that maybe they had to like, you know, get to a one o'clock meeting or something, but really good attendance. So thanks to everybody for joining. Roger. You have to give me a second to formulate a question. I meant to hit the clap hands. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's fine. No worries. Good to see you, Roger, no matter what. <laughs> so I, I can just ask a very general question. I mean, in terms of habitat, Richard, you know, Cisco, more pelagic oriented, like whitefish, more benthic oriented. Um, obviously, we don't know, as you said a couple of times, we don't know really where they are in the water column. We've got some new tags out to at least give that, give us that for whitefish. But just given what, how much you've studied the central, all basins of Lake Erie, I think, to, can you give us, give us a sense of which fish might be more habitat limited? I mean, Cisco potentially being sort of squeezed more from a sort of a temperature perspective, um, you know, at the top as it warms up where they'd like to be more epilimnetically or like in, in um, the metal in the end, but and then 
whitefish from some of that hypoxia in the bottom. I don't know if that's a fair question or not, but just these are two different, they occupy different niches and the dynamic nature of Lake Erie across its basins and vertically. Just made me sort of wonder your thoughts on that topic. Yeah, and I'll try not to, to, to wax on too much because um, a, a couple things with that, Bo, it, it, it's a, a, a probably a question, you know, those questions are on everybody's mind with this. And um, it is, uh, for both species, I think there's a dynamic here that um, is really interesting because it's not just a habitat question if we're talking about the populations of these species, the stocks of these species. So, um, you know, we have to we have to be thinking about uh, the 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 importance of uh, exploitation as well as the um, uh, you know other aspects of the habitat and uh, um, and it, you know ecosystem food web interactions as well. But um, I, you know, at times. Um, I'm inclined to lean one way or the other. One of the things that I think um, is important to point out is that, you know, I, I tried to make a case that we're at the Southern extent of the range, but we're not at the extreme Southern end of the range. And there are examples of Cisco in lakes in the Midwest uh, that are doing just fine uh, with conditions that uh, maybe even uh, by Lake Erie standards could be considered worse. Um, so we, we're, we, we have a legacy effect. I think that's important uh, context for your question, and I, I don't have a good answer for Cisco. Um, it helps to have um, these fish experimentally swimming around in the lake to inform that. Otherwise, it seems like m just more speculation. As far as Lake Whitefish goes, I think um, it's clear that the habitat um, provides some sufficiency because the populations persist on, and that's really interesting. And we can't deny that um, in the eastern basin, there's a huge volume of habitat it's more oligotrophic, um, so it's more like the upper lakes. And so we may be looking at a dynamic there uh, that would um, benefit from, you know, greater comparison with some what's happening in the upper lakes, uh, especially with respect to, um, you know, recruitment. Uh, the trick with Lake Whitefish is that um, we're tagging these fish in the West Basin, and there may be other spawning groups that uh, we can't define as well in Lake Erie. So. <clears throat> Uh, with uh, the looming threat of warming temperatures, which um, we have a really great data set from the uh, Buffalo water intake that shows uh, we keep losing uh, cold days during the winter, we may actually wind up with a situation that, that is truly limiting for Lake Whitefish. So um, I think I waxed on more than I no, led you to believe I would. <laughs> No, no, that's good. And we definitely have several hands up now. I think we'll alternate between raised hands and then questions people put in oh, the I chat. So let's, <laughs> let's start with, uh, with Chris Vandergoot first. All right. So just building on what uh, Richard or the question that was asked and what Richard kind of addressed a little bit. Um, what I was shocked to find in reading some of the gray literature, not published literature, and some of the harvest records were that was that commercial fishermen would report catching juvenile Cisco in the Western Basin in the summer months, in like August, you know, when theoretically you would expect the temperatures to be at their highest. And in all the years of uh, trawling on the Western end of Lake Erie and viewing the trawling data, I don't recall ever seeing any young of year or juvenile whitefish in that area of the lake, despite there being, you know, year classes uh, uh, occurring on a you know quasi-annual basis or throughout that period. So again, I don't know if it's a definitive answer, but it, well, I was kind of really shocked to see that juvenile uh, Cisco were observed in the Western end. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that addition. So Jim Markham asked, can you provide any insight as to why there seems to be a preference for the South Shore? So Jim, I, I'll um, uh, try to be brief that I, I think there's a combination of things going on there. I, I think one of the things to keep in mind is we have a sort of a north-south gradient in Lake Erie in the trophic status um, has to do a bit with sources of um, riverine inputs of nutrients and that kind of thing, turbidity and all of that. Um, I think that perhaps, um, uh, you know, those particular factors that could be beneficial for uh, foraging and also protection from predation 
um, they're going to diminish uh, with inhospitable conditions in the central basin due to hypoxia, which sometimes, especially early on, looks like it can develop along that south shore. So it doesn't extend uh, usually always as far east as, as say Pennsylvania and New York. I know that um, we've talked about how hypoxia can sometimes uh, burp out into the, into the east basin and kind of float there above the even colder water, but <clears throat> that's, a, that's a rare event. And so um, there may be something uh, to these fish uh, sort of avoiding that, but still wanting to be close to uh, basically a more productive area to feed. Um, the other side of this, I guess, is that um, uh, there could be some other factors with that particular habitat or particular uh, habitats in, in New York waters as well that um, uh, are uh, basically variables that, that we're not thinking about here, um, structure and, um, you know, other, other things that we know uh, can be important to fish. So um, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just stop there. You can kind of sort of see through the reads on the on the direction of my thinking with why why that could be important yeah and there's a, another comment from Ellery that asked very much the same question I think you you addressed it in your answer there um, so let's go to Ed Rutherford yeah thanks and thanks Richard wonderful talk and very thought-provoking uh, if you can put on your wax and wax on about uh, a little bit more about available prey for whitefish and is that, you know, how does that influence their movements uh, along with physical variables? And then any insights you have to why Cisco's appear to be expanding in other lakes, which have many of the same uh, environmental constraints as in Lake Erie. Okay, so two, two at least key things there. Um, feeding of, of whitefish. Um, so one of the things I would point your attention to is an interesting paper that I was involved in uh, tooting my own horn here with the, with the uh, Buff State folks uh, on dracenids and hypoxia. And I forget, you may have had some involvement in that too. There was a lot of people on the byline. Um, but, you know, um, as far as uh, benthic forage goes, where you have hypoxia occurring more frequently, you have fewer mussels and, and, and of course, as we know from other systems, uh, less forage. So this is another factor that uh, is potentially very important for um, why uh, Lake Whitefish uh, aren't as frequently detected out in the middle of the central basin and why they may uh, sort of uh, hang around the fringes, um, slightly shallower areas, and then areas uh, uh, that stretch out to the east. Uh, as far as the Cisco um, expansion goes in the other lakes, um, I guess uh, to tie it into Lake Erie, one of the things I alluded to with that picture uh, that I'm kind of excited about because, uh, you know, the data that we're collecting uh, could help us frame this and think about it a little bit better is um, this, uh, these few records that we're starting to pick up of, of Cisco captured on uh, reefs in the West Basin during the fall. And, um, you know, my hat's off to the Coldwater Task Group in Lake Erie who uh, prioritized trying to get some information uh, from these historic spawning grounds during historic spawning times, just to see if, you know, some of these straggling Cisco that were caught by the um, gill netters in Ontario uh, you know, may have, may actually result in some individuals showing up on those reefs. Uh, with uh, Joe Schmidt right now leading uh, that uh, survey effort in the fall, we've actually come up with um, two or three Cisco at a time, you know, in a, in a sampling season for the past couple of years. Uh, and it's very encouraging because some of these cannot be identified as fish that were stocked, for example, in Saginaw Bay or or, or, you know, or just uh, sort of uh, some of these um, uh, hybrid swarm individuals there. Uh, we're still working to, uh, uh, to identify their affinities and origins. Uh, so um, who knows, uh, there, there may be uh, something afoot in Lake Erie and, and, and we, just have to, we just have to keep looking in a little deeper, I think. 
excuse the pun. And the ones that, that have been collected, like I saw the, those Lake Erie, Cisco, they're very healthy. It doesn't look like prey is really limiting. I don't know, I haven't seen any Lake Erie, like whitefish to see if they look robust or emaciated, but I would assume they're also relatively robust. I mean, is there any sense of any prey limitation for either species or especially for like whitefish? No, and why I think whitefish are the are the right sort of first place to look. Um, one of the things we see with the lake whitefish that we also see in um, in walleye and other species is um, a large amount of visceral fat. Uh, you know that just really tells us. And if you look at the cold water task group report, what you find for lake whitefish and lake Erie is uh, just really high uh, Fulton's condition in the indices uh, as well. So. Um, you know, relative to other populations. So we've got, we've got um, probably not an issue with forage in Lake Erie, which you would expect because it's, you know, it's more eutrophic environment. Yeah, great. Yeah, the comments are endorsing what you just said too. Uh, Elvita asked if, have you ever considered looking at Delta 18 or Delta 13, Delta 18 oxygen, Delta 13 carbon in the odorless to see anything about previous habitat? I, I've been interested in that. Um, uh, I'm not aware of a, a, a data set yet. We're, um, uh, you know, part of this is also trying to uh, define the, the, the context for comparison in, in Lake Erie, the sort of spatial mapping of this and what it would mean. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of people working on this for contemporary uh, conditions and contemporary situations, but uh, the, the, it's very enticing to imagine going back in time and looking at these and trying to um, uh, parse out uh, that type of question. So, uh, uh, I'd be interested in talking more about it. Thanks for the question. Okay. Let's go to Ben Rook. He's been patient with his hand up. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about where we find Cisco in the upper lakes, and they're typically in areas where they're not going to be habitat limited. Um, but a lot of the areas where we're looking at restoring that species are potentially habitat limited or have been habitat limited in the past. Um, I think this would potentially be a good opportunity to I guess look at some of these real life habitat limitations because Lake Erie is one of those areas where we can kind of go back and look at that. Uh, are there any plans to do that and map areas like Green Bay and then Saginaw Bay and Huron and Michigan? Yeah, we've 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 had a, an interest in in doing the sort of uh, comparison of of just the kind that you uh, have um, mentioned. Um, uh, but we haven't haven't quite gotten going on that. So if if there's an interest, uh, uh, Ben, get, uh, contact me outside of this, and and maybe we can figure out the path forward. Uh, uh, I I think we could learn a lot uh, through those type of comparisons. Um, so I I follow your your thought process there, and I'm right in line with it. And you know I think just to follow up on that, we have these experimental studies where the data is fairly good, but we don't really have anything, you know, from real life observations. So this would be, I guess, another way to add to, you know, our knowledge base for that species. Absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah, kind of related to that. We do have these Cisco telemetry projects, not just Richards and Erie, but we've got one in Northern Lake Huron, one um, Grand Traverse Bay, now with more receivers out in the main basin. And I think interest in establishing, well, no, actually Daryl, I don't know if Daryl's on, but um, has made a valiant effort to try to get Cisco also tagged in, um, in Lake Superior. Saginaw Bay as well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, so, um, so putting all that together, coupling it with the habitat modeling, with the th oxythermal information. Um, yeah, I think those are really important ways for us to figure out whether or not habitat still would be limiting, especially for Cisco. Um, there's, and there's a lot of areas. Oh, sorry. 
I was just going to add, there's a lot of important foundational work being done by, you know, not just uh, like Tunison Lab, but uh, Fish and Wildlife and, and others as well to give us these tools about uh, best practices for tagging, how to, uh, you know, the factors that influence survival and um, come up with really good data. So um, I, I have, it's hard for me to think of an example quite as good as this in terms of the potential to really learn some useful um, uh, information for management. That's a great point. I mean, think about this. Five years ago, somebody thought, let's tag some Cisco. And I think a lot of people thought they'll never survive. Like, you right. can't do it. They're too fragile or whatever. But we figured out a way to do it. It's, uh, yeah, kudos to, yeah. Those, to all those people that have made that happen. Uh, we have a question here from Scott Soaw from Nature Conservancy. Do you know or have ideas on why most of the data points are coming from a smaller number of receivers? I, that's a question that I'm still scratching my head over. So one of the things whenever you see this that you need to determine is whether uh, there is a detection range issue. There could be some you know, receivers that are just exceptionally good and some that are just in bad places. Um, need to rule that out first. And we have looked at this uh, and don't have any reason to suspect that that's what's taking place, but um, that doesn't mean that the question, you know, is is uh, answered there. Um, the other thing to think about is that um, on one scale of habitat, these are pretty big detection ranges, so uh, it's it's also possible that there is something attractive at those handful of receiver locations that we just don't have knowledge of. Um, maybe it relates to, um, uh, who said it here in the chat? I'm not gonna be able to find it right away, but cobbles, substrate, boulders, you know, something physical perhaps about the habitat, something, something else about the habitat that, that uh, uh, is important. Um, I will let you know that even with walleye and some of the other species we've tagged, these areas uh, seem to be important for them as well. So, you know, what's good for uh, the Corgonids in Lake Erie may also be attractive to some of these other species, which is, a, again, potentially another clue. I mean, kind of related to that, Richard, when you showed your Cisco animations, it looked like there was a lot coming out from the more Western site, and then they moved kind of East. And then the Eastern site was the, there seemed to be some initial ones and then they kind of went away. So could that be just that receiver tending issue that you mentioned? It, it is exactly that, uh, okay. Bo. And I, and I, I should have um, kind of encircled that to emphasize it because the the dots of just the receivers that didn't have a detection were harder to see. And I, and I apologize for that, but there's a, there's a very large area in the deep portion of the Eastern Basin along the Pennsylvania Ridge and a little bit into the Central Basin, which we know are probably good areas for these fish that are blank right now until we tend the receivers there this year. So anyway, that's why it's a developing story in, <laughs> in the way I showed it. Tim Johnson's uh, here in the chat uh, telling us about other efforts in Lake Ontario and Shimo Bay and Bay of Quinty um, and plans to do more Cisco and Lake Whitefish work, including this archival, or if we can, as you described there in your last slides, if we can get the tag back, we get a much better sense of um, depth and temperature and all that. Uh, and Jim Markham, White fish distribution in our assessments is always very patchy. Um, yeah, and Jim, I think you also have had efforts to try to get spawning, try to get them in spawning reefs sort of late in the year, and that's been challenging too, if, I, if I've heard that right. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to pop your camera on and talk about that at all, Jim. But. That's okay. The the, uh, the the patchiness um, is important also, um, and this goes to Scott Sola's question potentially. Um, another thing to think about is that they, they do shoal quite a bit. Um, so if they're shoaling near one receiver, we're getting a lot of detections of a lot of fish together. 
at those locations. And as they move around, um, that could be part of the dynamic uh, social interactions if you want to think about it that way. Um, Again, I'm arm waving, speculating, but this is this is interesting uh, intersection uh, of the abiotic and the biotic and the ecosystem interactions here. Yeah. yeah. Ben Leonhardt has a stand up. Hey, Richard. Um, hey ben. You mentioned that uh, about twenty five percent of the of the Cisco stock were um, eat, eat, eaten, and I was yes. just wondering of. The ones that were with so where 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 were they eating at? Were they the ones that were stocked in the Western Basin or the ones in in, in New York? I'm just considering because in, in May there's going to be a lot of, of wal walleye in, in the Western ba Basin. Right. Um, so I I kind of have to punt until we get the receiver data back from the east. Um, I don't feel confident in in making the comparison. There were. Uh, predation signals detected in both groups, but the um, uh, the numbers at risk that we could um, you know use in our analysis through time declined too quickly uh, from the release that was near Dunkirk that um, Jim Markham's office helped with. So um, I, circle back with me on that, Ben. Um, it, it's a very interesting question, uh, and you know not only for the reason that you mentioned with the presence of predators, but uh, just in general, the environments are different, the visibility is different, and, and that sort of thing. That uh, And there's lake trout, uh, which have bigger mouths uh, over in the east. <laughs> I, I say, I, I was a little surprised that it was that high with, you know, some some of those Cisco were, you know, they weren't all small c c Cisco that, 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 that were stocked. So I was just, um, so some, I was wondering, do you know, you know, the, were the Cisco that were eaten? Were they primarily the, primarily just the the smaller ones that 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 that, that were stocked, or were some of the larger ones too? Were I, I got to go back and 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 look more closely at that uh, uh, to see. Ben, sorry, I don't I don't have an answer for you on that one. I, but I, cool. But it's a good Thanks, question. Man. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great question. Maybe while we see if there's one more outstanding question there, I can just ask a, a simple question, Richard. You talked a lot about whether we know if they're on the bottom or not. If you get an ar archival tag back, you would know its depth, yes. but you still wouldn't know exactly what the bottom depth was at that site, or or, or would you? Do you actually do you have locational information in addition to depth data, or when we can when not with the archival data, but the archival data is time stamped. So if we can match a detection with the archival data, uh, then we can say something about the water depth, at least within you know, range. the range of detection. Yeah. It makes sense. Okay, cool. Okay, well, we're getting a lot of people just thanking you again in the comments. Um, again, fantastic talk. We had a nice discussion here and Great interest in what you all are doing in Lake Erie and its applicability to uh, especially some of the other large embayments uh, where or these, uh, especially Cisco are of course not doing and not uh, doing as well, but they were really important historically. Um, whitefish too. I mean, there are whitefish, a lot of interest in the upper lakes about whitefish. For um, sure. Recruitment habitat. So, so thanks again for joining us and uh, everybody will look forward to our, another whitefish talk in Europe, um, April the 1st, and we'll let you know about time.